Boy, has it been a while since we visited this world of the Tsukiyomi. For those who missed the last episode, we'll give you a link to view it. It's best that you check out that before continuing to avoid spoilers. Don't worry, we can wait. But for those who have seen that episode and merely need a small reminder of events, this is basically what happened. Naruto's story up to the point of joining the academy is mostly the same. However, Naruto now has the inability to use ninjutsu, and because of that, it looks like he'll never be able to become a genin. Distraught, he begins to give up hope until Might Guy appears. After an inspirational message, Might Guy trains Naruto super hard to awaken his eight inner gates to bolster his strength. For this, Naruto trains to failure for a year. He then takes the exam again, where he passes based on the merit of his hard work. He's placed on Team Guy beside Tenten and Neji, and the quartet then make their way to the Land of Waves after receiving a mission there. Neji and Naruto manage to soundly beat Haku all on their own, and Might Guy proves to be Zabuza's superior in every way as well, and the Land of Waves manages to be free of Gata's influence. However, upon returning home, Guy realizes that the Chunin exams are coming, and decides to include his team in the exams. And that's about where we stopped. From here, Naruto will proceed to take the exams and face new challenges, both within himself and in the outside world. Welcome to the Amagi! Before we begin, only 25% of our viewers are subscribed, so if you're a fan of the video, please like and double check if you are subscribed, and with that out of the way, let's get into it. Naruto sat there, pencil in hand, looking at his blank piece of paper. Time was already halfway up, and he hadn't even begun the test. He hadn't expected the tuning exams to have a written test. He'd heard the stories of what the tuning exams were supposed to be, and it was definitely not this. It was supposed to be action-packed, physical. There were supposed to be words spelt out in blood, sweat, and tears. Pure bone and sinew were supposed to be that with which they communicated, not some graphite pencil. He had trained his body to failure, but not his mind. He was completely blindsided by this test, and because of that, he couldn't even dare to answer a question on it. He wanted to pass, but he wasn't sure he had the ability to answer this test's questions. All the same, he would not give up. To give up was to accept defeat before even beginning. Maybe it was a long shot, as every question would be a pure shot in the dark, but Guy sensei had always taught him that it was best to at least try and then fail, rather than never having tried at all. And so, Naruto began answering questions. He was answering them wrongly, and he knew that, but he was answering them anyway. After this, the final question was revealed. The question was different from the rest. Whatever it was, it was important. The most important if it was make or break. The proctor made it sound like getting this question right was all it took to pass or fail the test. Naruto thought this was peculiar. The proctor had caused a panic when he stated that all those who failed to answer the question correctly would be sent back to their masters in disgrace, unable to ever again ascend to the rank of Chunin. Naruto nearly freaked out himself. He wanted to throw in the towel. After all, his dream was to ascend to the highest rank in the land. How could he do that without first ascending to this new rank? It was then that Naruto remembered something. It was as if Might Guy were in the room with him, telling him an old story. He remembered how the man Guy Sensei venerated most, his father, Might Die, was the eternal Genin. Naruto thought about those things. Being a shinobi is something that nobody can take away from you, Guy had said to him. Thinking on this, Naruto realized the importance of moving forward. Regardless of the consequences to his failure, he was a true man and would not be weighed down by fear. He was going to become Hokage, whether he was a Chunin or not. That was his dedication. And so, with vigor in his heart, he refused to back down and accepted the question. However, by simply accepting the question, he passed. The proctor told them all that the only wrong answer to this test was cowardice, and that the only thing that could stop anyone from becoming a Chunin was their own fear. As a Chunin, people would be expected to deal with some truly horrific things, and they would be trusted with great secrets by the village to protect that they could not give up. The only shinobi worthy of becoming a Chunin was one that was willing to give up anything and everything for their village. Only those were worthy of bearing the title. And so, any who remained to take the final test were the only ones worthy of continuing to the next round. And so they did. The second round was the Forest of Death. This was the task that Naruto remembered from most of the many stories he'd been told. The Forest of Death was a mainstay of any tuning exams held by Konoha. Each team had to brave the thick brush of the woods, relying upon nobody but each other to make it through. It was a massive game of capture the flag where everyone possessed at least half of one flag. A truly novel concept to encourage a battle royale between teams. Having been given their scroll, Team Guy was set at the gate. Guy met with them before they went to encourage them, offering them a thumbs up and a glimmering smile. I know you all can do it. I'll be watching from the control room. Then they waited. As soon as the doors opened, Naruto entered the forest. 
the team rushed in as fast as they could. They took stock of the scroll that they had attained, which appeared to be an Earth scroll. They needed a Heaven scroll, but the issue with this is that they didn't know what teams achieved what scrolls, so this type of mission would require reconnaissance. This was a fine thing, as Neji's Byakugan would come in clutch. All they needed to do was let Neji search for nearby teams and steal their scroll. It was then that they came across a nearby team from the village hidden in the sound. A mysterious village that was to participate in this joint tuning exams held by Konoha and Sunagakure. Upon reaching this group, Neji confirms that they possess a Heaven Scroll. The group decides to make their stand against Team Dosu. They rush to face them, attempting to get the drop on them, but they were far more skilled than they seemed. As they approached the encampment, Ten Ten stepped on a wire attached to Senbon and a bell. The bell began to ring, causing Ten Ten to freak out. She snapped the wire and suddenly Senbon came rushing at her. Neji blocked it all with use of his palm rotation technique, but this gave them away. Team Dosu was now aware of their presence, so direct confrontation was their only hope. Naruto was ready for this though, he desired it even, and rushed out to face them. Neji and Tenten weren't far behind. They began to decide who would take who, and it was decided that Tenten would take Kintsuchi, since neither Neji nor Naruto particularly wanted to punch a girl. That and her abilities of using Senbon in her attack made her a weapon user like Tenten. Not to mention, it was Ten Ten who learned the most from watching the battle with Haku, so she'd be more prepared for this. Neji took Zaku Abumi, believing that he could handle whatever strange mods the boy had in his body. Naruto was left to face Dosu. His gimmick remained unclear, but Naruto was adamant that it did not matter as Naruto had the strength to blitz him. Naruto would rush Dosu, attempting to strike out at him. However, he had severely underestimated the speed of this shinobi. Dosu managed to get out of the way of the attack and struck out at Naruto. Naruto dodged this with a smile. Was this the best this fella had? There was no way he could beat Naruto. Naruto pressed the attack, but Dosu only seemed to smile more. As Naruto struck more, he would suddenly be hit with incredible nausea, which would cause him to vomit. Naruto felt like the room was starting to spin. What's happening to me? He thought to himself. Have I been poisoned? No. Impossible. Dosu hasn't even touched me. As if reading his thoughts, Dosu spoke. No, you haven't been poisoned. I simply turned your senses against you. With the sound I can make with my speaker, I can stimulate your inner ear and disrupt your equilibrium. This results in pain, nausea, and vertigo. Good luck defeating me when you can barely even stand. Naruto was feeling woozy, but he continued to fight. Ten Ten was facing off against Kin. The two were indeed maining their weaponry. Despite her limited arsenal, Ten Ten had to give Kin credit. She could take a single tool and hone it into her best weapon. Sometimes quantity didn't matter. All that one needed to kill somebody was a shish kebab skewer. Ten Ten would unfurl her scroll in the air and send out a wave of kunai in Kin's direction, which she barely dodged. She would then fling her senbon at Ten Ten, which Ten Ten would catch and seal inside of her scroll. She began to charge, using hit and run tactics, trying to keep her on her toes. Ten Ten wanted Kin to pay attention to her. She didn't want her to know that she already had her beaten. Everywhere Ten Ten went, a new scroll was placed open. By the end of it, Ten Ten simply circled around her with a scroll, almost wrapping her in it. In a moment after, Ten Ten would activate the scrolls, which would strike Kin, defeating her. On the other end of the battle, Neji was facing off against Zaku. He utilized his Byakugan to look inside his opponent and discovered the hollow pipes leading up through his arms. These were the modifications he had done to himself, but what were they for? Zaku was the first to go on the offensive. Neji dodged back, avoiding the blast of air and sound waves entirely. So, you focus chakra through your arms and make sound and air blasts. Interesting. Back to Naruto, he'd been weakened by Dosu, but he wasn't out of the woods yet. As Dosu went to strike him, Naruto dodged, much to his enemy's surprise. What? You're supposed to be helpless as a drunk man. How are you still fighting? Naruto raised his arms again. Dosu was right, he did feel drunk, but this was something that Might Guy already knew. Naruto couldn't handle his alcohol, which meant he got drunk very easily. And because of that, Guy learned the hard way that Naruto was naturally gifted with the drunken fist technique. So, as the attacks came in, Naruto dodged them with such limberness and speed that it seemed as if he had attained some twisted version of Ultra Instinct. Naruto would turn around and swing his body with enough force to strike Dosu in the solar plexus and send him flying, knocking him out. All the while, Neji fought Zaku. You'd better be careful with those arms. That's your only warning. Zaku scoffed and attempted to strike Neji again with a blast, but before he could, Neji tapped a few pressure points on his arms. As Zaku attempted to fire his attack, there was a severe backfire that caused damage to his arms, nearly blowing them completely off. This scene was brutal, so much so that Tenten herself threw up just as Naruto had, but for a different reason. Naruto approached Dosu and took his scroll. Let's get out of here, Neji said. Naruto stopped him though. What? Neji asked. Naruto was kneeling over Zaku, examining him. We can't just leave him here like this. Naruto said. Why should we care? Neji asked. I warned him. He brought this on himself. Naruto looked at the poor boy. 
He seemed semi-conscious by this point. The traumatic experience had left him fractured, however, as his open eyes seemed to stare off into space. He had locked himself in his own head to protect his mind from the reality of how brutally wounded he was. He's bleeding really badly, and his arms are shattered. I won't leave him like this. Neji scoffed. He's our enemy, Naruto. Even if he dies, it makes no difference to us. Naruto shook his head. No, this isn't war. And even if it was, I can't consign someone young who has their whole life ahead of them to die needlessly. Give me the first aid kit. Neji scoffed. We were gonna set a record. Ten Ten brought Naruto the medical supplies. Naruto added a numbing agent to both of the boy's arms to dull the pain. He then attempted to stop the bleeding, which was easier said than done. Unable to stop it, he merely slowed it down. He attempted to set his arms the best he could and wrap them up. Naruto realized that this still wasn't enough. Fine, I'll just carry him. Neji and Tenten were surprised by this. Naruto loaded the boy up on his shoulders. As I said, I'm not gonna leave him to die. This is just a test for a higher ranking. I'd rather remain a Genin than kill an innocent person for a chance to become Junin. He looked over his shoulder at the boy. You're gonna be okay. I'm gonna get you to some doctors. I think your arms will be fine. We just need somebody to tend to them. Naruto knew that this was for the best. Most shinobi would demand to continue the exams anyway, but there was no way this one could. He was still dying, even if Naruto wasn't going to tell him that, and there was no way for him to continue like this. Naruto had to save him now. And so, bearing both scrolls, Neji led the way as Naruto followed behind. Ten Ten came up the rear, keeping Naruto six. They made it to the center of the forest as requested and utilized the scrolls to summon Iruka sensei who would congratulate them. However, he'd be surprised to see Naruto carrying someone else. What happened here? Naruto looked to Iruka. This boy is Zaku Abumi of Team Dosu. He's been brutally wounded in battle by accident, and I wouldn't leave him to die. Please, summon a doctor immediately, Iruka-sensei. I don't want this boy to die for a simple exam. Iruka nodded and summoned a doctor. The doctor would come and take the boy off, or he would proceed to examine him. It was evident that reconstructive surgery was the only option, so they had Zaku taken back to Konoha proper for treatment. However, before leaving, the doctor thanked Team Guy, stating that the prognosis was bright, and there was even a chance that Zaku could continue his career if they managed to fix the internal damage. He said that if they had left him behind, he would have died. Even Neji began to show a sort of guilty look on his face, realizing that he nearly consigned someone to death over this. Naruto would comfort him, telling him that they all signed a waiver before entering the forest. Everyone knew the risks, and there were chances many students could die. Neji hadn't done anything wrong, and in fact, Naruto had shown what some might consider weakness in such a dangerous place. But he told Neji that what he had done was a good deed in helping them save Zaku, so there was definitely no blood on Neji's hands now. And this was a perfect moment to learn what was most important for a warrior to know. When was mercy beneficial? And when should they draw the line on killing or helping someone? It was a true shinobi dilemma. But Naruto had faith that as long as they entered battle with a heart full of honor and kindness, the law written in their hearts would guide them to do what was right. Despite such a contentious moment, this had caused Team Guy to grow closer, and had changed their perceptions of each other as they realized the sanctity of life and pierced through the veil of hatred into true understanding and unconditional love. Something that Hiruzen would consider upon reading the report of what had happened in the forest. This could do nothing but bring a smile to the old Hokage's face, as he realized that the future was in good hands with Shinobi who cared this much for the lives of others. They took time to rest. After this, the third and final exam began. It was a one-on-one -on -one exhibition tournament. This was where Naruto knew he could truly shine, and where he knew that the individual merits based on his own hard work would be put to the test. Naruto hoped desperately to face off against Neji once again. He had grown since the Land of Waves, and had done nothing but study the Gentle Fist technique, and had managed to understand it due to the similarities it shared with the Eight Gates. Whereas the Eight Gates focused Chakra through eight larger Tenketsu, the Gentle Fist targeted smaller Tenketsu that were already open. It was through this that Naruto realized that if Neji grew too close, he could actually shut off Naruto's Eight Gates, or possibly force him to activate the Eighth Gate of Death by accident. Not that Neji would purposefully do such a thing, but it was a possibility, and Naruto was mending his fighting style to defend from such things. Neji's first opponent was, ironically, his cousin, Hinata. Naruto knew that he had a hatred for Hinata due to her higher status, which is why he confronted Neji before the match to speak with him. I know you hold a grudge against Hinata. Neji didn't even have to look back to see Naruto. He had near 360 degree fisheye vision. What is it to you? Neji asked. Naruto spoke. I'm telling you to go easy on her. Neji finally turned back to face him. Who are you to ask me to do such a thing? Naruto kept his eyes fixed on Neji. Neji stood and walked to face Naruto down, their chests bumping, their foreheads nearly touching as their intense gazes burned into the other. You have no right to step into this, Naruto. 
Maybe I allowed you to interfere with my decisions and the fate of Zaku, but I won't let you do the same here. Naruto continued looking into Neji's eyes. I know your life is hell, he said, but don't take that out on Hinata. I know her, and she's not mean or malevolent. She's innocent in this, and if you punish her for something she didn't do, I won't forgive you. Neji almost laughed. You think I need your approval? Your forgiveness? Screw you and your moral code. I'll do what I desire. Neji began to walk away. Naruto called after him. You know deep down that she's innocent. You know that she's not responsible for the fate you find yourself in, and neither are you. She's a good person, and she cares about you. Anything you do to her, I'll unleash upon you tenfold, Neji. Neji left the room. Naruto went up to stand with the rest of them and watch the match. Right before it began, Neji looked up at Naruto and saw a cold, expecting icy glare. Neji scoffed. What's his deal, he asked within himself. Does he have a crush on Hinata or something? I'll do what I want. In fact, I'll beat her harder because he told me not to. I'll leave her so close to death and so maimed that even her bastard of a father won't be able to recognize her. The match began and Neji made a good show of his desire to beat her brutally. Truth be known, Hinata hardly stood a chance and she knew that. He was being sloppy with his attacks. He wasn't attempting to strike her pressure points. He knew that she couldn't beat him, so he continued to strike out at her with the intent just to hurt her. She stumbled back and reached for her wounds. The look of pain on her face was intense and as the battle dragged on, it became evident that she was running out of gas. She still raised her hands to fight further. She was determined not to go down without a fight. Neji almost smiled knowing that he could beat her even more without having to worry about reprisal. After all, it was a rule that the Hyuga could not interfere and… He looked at her and saw tears in her eyes as she continued to stand there. She was crying. Tears of pain. Tears of fear. Whatever it was, it was dripping from her cheeks. Suddenly, the words of Naruto echoed through his head, unwanted and intrusive. She's innocent! Neji looked up at the crowd watching and saw Naruto standing there, arms crossed, an expecting look on his face. Neji turned back to Hinata. Forgive me, he said. I've been too rough. She shook her head. No, I'm a shinobi, not a princess. We're equals, neither above or below. This is what I want. Give me everything you've got, she demanded. He smiled. Okay. He would once again go back to fighting her, but this time his attempts to strike were cleaner. The gentle fist was a technique based on accuracy, so the better one was at using it, the quicker they could defeat their opponent. The strongest users of this technique could defeat any opponent without hurting them, and Neji was going to prove that he was the best. When she attacked, he stepped into it and pushed the arm she was attempting to strike with to the side, before he himself struck at her various pressure points. He pushed her back. She hit the ground. She attempted to stand and re-enter a fighting stance, but as she stood there, she stumbled forward, then backward, and then fell on her side, foaming at the mouth. The match was over. Neji walked to her and tapped a few Tenketsu to undo the damage, which brought her back to consciousness and allowed her to stand, even if it was through the pins and needles pain of a numb body. She'd be brought out of the area to rest. As Neji left the arena, he met with Naruto, who offered a smile and thanked him for not torturing her. I didn't do it for you, Neji said. I don't give a damn what you say you'll do to me. I did this for myself and her, as respect not for the heiress she's viewed as, but as the shinobi that I know she is. That's the only reason she's still breathing. You'd best remember that. Naruto nodded and let Neji walk by. All the same, Naruto smiled. He knew the honest truth. Neji wasn't as bad a guy as he seemed. He had a heart. He merely covered it to hide it, afraid people might hurt it. But Naruto felt sad that Neji had yet to realize that his heart was not his greatest weakness, but his greatest strength. Naruto was glad to know that he had all the time in the world to help him learn that. Naruto's match was up next. It would be a match between Naruto and Gara of the Sand. He'd walk out to meet Gara, who would be standing there waiting for him. Naruto would offer acknowledgement to Gara, but Gara would offer him nothing. Naruto's frown became evident all the more, so he resolved to kick his ass. As soon as the battle started, Naruto rushed at Gara, attempting to defeat him, but his attacks were all stopped by his sand shield. Naruto couldn't break through, and as the battle slowed to a halt, Guy called out to Naruto, telling him it was okay to remove his ankle weights, and telling him that he could utilize all the techniques he had learned within reason. Naruto smiled. After removing his ankle weights, the weight of which surprised all those around him, Naruto rushed into battle against Gara. Gara was shocked at the speed of Naruto's attacks. He was almost about to break through his shield, but he wasn't there yet. Naruto would then power up through his various inner gates until he reached the fifth. Naruto would manage to outspeed the shield and begin to hit Gara. Naruto would then reach out and grab Gara with his wraps, wrapping him up. He would lift him into the air and spin in a circle before diving straight down, using the reverse lotus. The attack would land, but it left Naruto wounded and tired. He assumed he'd beaten Gara, but he was wrong. Gara was still moving. Gara would use his sand to grip Naruto's arm and leg and shatter it out of spite. 
Naruto cried out in pain as Gara continued growing closer to him to kill him. Tenten -ten asked if Gai would save Naruto, but Gai refused. He told Tenten -ten that Naruto didn't need saving, he needed a catalyst. Tenten -ten was surprised, questioning what this meant. Gai merely told her to watch. Naruto watched as Gara grew closer and closer to finish him off. Naruto was terrified. He saw within Gara the exact opposite of his own mentality. There was no love in his heart, despite the kanji on the boy's head. There was only hate and misery, and now he was about to kill a helpless opponent. You came this far against me. I respect that. But you dared think yourself as good as I. For that, I won't forgive you. Only I am the great carnage that will overtake you and your village. Go to your grave and burn in hell. In that moment, something within Naruto snapped. He roared out as an intense aura suddenly surrounded him. Gara was blown back by this and startled by the power displayed here. The entire crowd went silent as the sensory types, particularly the old Chunin and Jonin, suddenly had a chill run down their spine. They came to the edge and looked. Naruto laid there as he was covered with a red aura. He growled and roared as his arm and leg began to regenerate from the damage done. Pure chakra stitching the bones and muscles back together. Naruto stood up, his body covered in an impressive red aura. Is that the 8th gate guy sensei? Tenten -ten asked. He shook his head. No, that is the Nine Tails Demon Cloak. Tenten -ten then realized. Wait, is Naruto the Nine Tailed Demon Fox from so many years ago? Guy nodded slightly. In a sense. Naruto stepped forward. He looked at his hands, unsure what was happening to him. But in the moment, he didn't care. It felt good. Ecstasy. He was drunk on power. His power. Bloodshed was the only thing he craved. He took a step forward and suddenly rushed him. Naruto would reach out and strike him, punching clean through his sand shield. Gara rolled and then rose to his knees. Gara was bleeding from his forehead. He was certain that he had his shield up. What happened? Naruto grew closer to him. Gara backed up a little. Impossible! This is impossible! You can't even use ninjutsu! Naruto drew closer. His sharpened canines, like the fangs of a vampire, were born from his lips. The sharpness of their tips already having lacerated the upper layers of the skin on his lips. Every second, he looked more and more like a demon. His muscles bulged ever so slightly, giving his already muscular body a slightly more swollen look. Perhaps it was a trick of the eye, or perhaps Gara was merely hallucinating in terror, but he seemed to believe that Naruto was over 9 feet tall, with muscles the size of pumpkins. Of course, nobody else saw it that way. He was barely any different from how he appeared before, but to Gara, he saw the blankness in Naruto's eyes, the darkness of his heart, and what appeared to be a fox's ears. He was demonic, possessed. Gara half expected wings to appear from his back and a forked tail. Gara recognized this demon. It was like the one within him, though it felt even stronger, and for that, his demon raged in its cage. Gara, for fear that he would die, let his demon out to do as it wished. It took over his body, transforming half of his face and one of his arms into an evil sandy claw. Gara's mind was flooded with hatred and pure drunkenness on this power. Some of the Jonin were pulling the Genin away from the banister. Guy simply stood there, intent to see what would happen next. Naruto rushed in and struck out at the beast. It had borne its full power in the body of Gara in an attempt to stop its rival from long past. That was the difference. Gara had allowed Shukaku out. Naruto was still trying to rein Kurama in. But Kurama would have none of this. He activated the five gates that Naruto had awakened earlier and supplemented it with his own chakra. This increased Naruto's strength and potency quite a bit. Naruto managed to grab hold of Shukaku's arm and broke through it with the grip of his hand. Shukaku, and by extension Gara, screamed out. It was moving so fast that its after images looked as if Naruto had spawned hundreds of semi-translucent shadow clones, all merged together. Naruto's attacks came from all directions. Gara felt claws ripping at its body his flesh being shredded faster than Shukaku could regenerate. Gara was going to die. Gara, a bloodied mess by this point, was knocked back, begging forgiveness and mercy on the ground. Naruto grew closer, the voice of both Naruto and Kurama speaking as one. You once chastised me for daring to face you. Now I do the same to you and your beast. Never forget the number of tails you have, Shukaku. You are now and forever will be the weakest of all tailed beasts. Think about that over the next few years it takes you to regenerate. Naruto raised his clawed hand to kill Gara, but that was until his hand was grabbed by Might Guy. Naruto turned and growled at him, offering a feral bark. Guy looked to Naruto. That's enough, Naruto. I know chakra control isn't your strong suit, but willpower is. Remember why you spared Zaku. Remember why you demanded Neji not torture Hinata. Don't let this beast make you a hypocrite. Tell it no. Naruto stood there for a second as suddenly his claw closed into a fist. His teeth grit as he stared off into space. 
He strained a little and suddenly the aura disappeared. Naruto fell to his knees, energy spent. He was conscious, but not enough to do more than breathe and stare at his master blankly. Gara rose with his clawed hand to strike Naruto down. Guy would activate the seventh gate for but a split second just to strike out at Gara and send him flying into the nearest wall. Gara fell unconscious. Guy would lift Naruto up and carry him out. Naruto was declared healthy without a single fractured bone. He'd proceed to resume training as soon as he could. The exams were halted for approximately one month due to the recent event in which two Jinchurikis nearly had a full-on kaiju deathmatch. They had to reevaluate the safety of letting Naruto continue. They came to the conclusion that the best thing to do was consult the Hokage, and the Hokage assigned Jiraiya to test and train him to make sure that he was no danger to the village. Jiraiya would agree and be introduced to the boy by Guy. Jiraiya would explain to him better what he was and what it meant, and tried to soften the blow of such knowledge. But how could anyone be content with such knowledge? Naruto finally understood why he was hated, but Jiraiya told him it was a gift if he worked hard enough to use it. Fear faded, then alleviated with love and peace, and he promised to help Naruto figure that out. Naruto was unable to truly mold any chakra, but this didn't have anything to do with chakra control as it seemed. What it did have to do with was the principle of emotional and mental control. Willpower. If Naruto's will was stronger than Kurama's, Naruto could control the beast. And so he began teaching Naruto how to tap into this power and control the Ninetales. For a month, Naruto worked on this until the day he finally got to use it. Naruto was set to face off against Neji, which was what he was hoping to do from the start. But before they could begin, the area was enshrouded by smoke as Orochimaru bombed the Hokage's viewing box. Since Gara was already defeated, however, it was the Sound 4 that appeared to help. Naruto and Neji together would rush to help the Hokage, but he and Orochimaru were trapped in some form of sealing jutsu held up by the Sound 4. And so Naruto and Neji began attacking them, with Naruto's strength quickly outclassing Neji and the Four. The mixture of the Eight Gates and the Nine-Tailed Demon Cloak were perfect. Naruto was calling forth power beyond his own imagination, and it was all fine on his body as any and all damage was being healed by the Cloak. Naruto managed to take out the Sound 4. Together, he and Neji made it into the sealed off area where Hiruzen and Enma were facing off against Orochimaru. Hiruzen commanded the two to stay away from the battle, telling them that it was too dangerous. But Naruto and Neji were only emboldened and went into attack. As they did, they both drew close to Orochimaru, with Naruto using his incredible strength to push Orochimaru back, while Neji came through and attempted to arrest Orochimaru's Tenketsu. Hiruzen was astounded by their teamwork and their ability to bring down one of the most powerful shinobi that Hiruzen had ever met. Hiruzen would then pass out. The battle was over, and though there were casualties, Konoha had repelled the attack. The Sand's attack on the leaf was halted before it could even begin, with Naruto having defeated Gara so soundly. And with the Sound 4 and Orochimaru completely defeated, the attack would be stopped before it could begin in earnest. For this, Naruto and Neji would be awarded the title of Chunin, Orochimaru would be locked away for what he had done, where he would rot. This whole ordeal had caused Hiruzen to understand what level of shinobi Naruto could be, which is why he asked for Gai's permission to let Naruto train further with Jiraiya to see if he could become more than this. Gai would approve, and Jiraiya would be sent to Naruto to tell him that he'd be allowed to train under him for a while. Naruto was nervous about being away from Gai, but he was comforted by his mentor telling him that as long as he remembered the things he'd been taught, he would have Gai with him. Naruto would smile happily at these things and would agree to go with Jiraiya, where the two planned to focus most of their training on controlling the Ninetales. But unbeknownst to them, a dark force was moving in the world, one that would soon set the entire shinobi world on its head. And that's where I plan to stop it for now. Naruto being able to defeat Gara is just a fact of life. Gara was more resilient than Lee was, but Naruto's strength surpassed that of Gara with simply the tailed beast cloak. Imagine what would happen if Naruto had been able to utilize up to the fifth gate. And with the nine tails demon cloak's regenerative healing factor, it'd be no stretch to believe that Naruto could negate all the negative effects of using the fifth gate. I wonder what else Naruto could do by mixing the gates with the nine tails power. I suppose we'll have to wait and see. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, be sure to click the like button and leave a comment below telling us what your favorite part was. And don't forget to subscribe and ring that bell to be notified about our latest videos as they drop. And if you can't wait for that, here are some other videos that I think you might like. Until next time, peace.